We have been everywhere. From the highest peaks to the deepest fathoms. We have seen everything from the smallest elements to the farthest corners of space. We have built empires, defied gravity, conquered the elements. We have cured diseases, made a heart beat again, made the impossible possible again. Who are we? We are humanity. And there is no limit to what we can accomplish together. Hey, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. And this is going to be an awesome morning. We are in week two of our brand new uh, Who Needs God series where we are taking some time to talk through this question. How many of you guys know, uh, just with a raise of hand, the answer to this question, who needs God? We do, right? Now, there are some of you, I understand this, in this room that maybe struggle with the answer to that question. You're thinking, I don't even know if I need a God. Because, to be honest, Matt, I don't even know if there is a God. I don't know if, if God is a real thing. And um, you know, we, I told you last week, I want this to be... Uh, an incredibly safe church for anyone who has questions. Like questions. I don't know where, I don't know when someone like gave us the idea that somehow a church is the wrong place to walk in with questions. Because uh, somehow, like, if I walk in and I ask questions, it'll, it'll highlight the fact that I'm not sure about something or I doubt or I disbelieve. Listen, join the party. We all struggle with doubt. And, and disbelief at times, and despair, and there's things going on in our lives that spark questions. And questions are welcome here. God gave us a mind to think. He gave us this ability to process the world around us and to, to figure out how all of that relates to the possibility of this incredible question of who needs God. Listen, this is a, an incredible place to come and, and belong even before you believe. It's my promise to you. You belong here before you believe like I do. And you might not ever believe like I do. You'll always belong here at Arundel Christian Church with your questions. Speaking of questions, there, was a, uh, there were these two brothers. And the brothers weren't very well behaved. They constantly got into trouble. They were constantly giving their mom a hard time. And mom was just sick and tired of it. Uh, she, she didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, dad was always traveling, so he couldn't help for, for some reason. And, and she just didn't know what to do with her sons. So she said, listen, if you guys don't start behaving, I'm going to make you, I'm going to take you to the church across the street, and you're going to have to talk to the pastor there. And the boys were like, ooh. <laughs> so they didn't change their behavior. So mom says, he grabs the oldest one by the wrist and marches across the street to the church across the street. And she goes into the pastor's office and she explains what's going on. She sits him down and she walks out and the pastor looks at him and says, son, where is God? And the boy started slouching in his seat a little bit. And the pastor looked at him again and says, son, where is God? And he starts slouching, and you can tell his face is just on the verge of tears. And the pastor says it again. He says, where is God? And the boy gets up from his seat, starts crying, running across the, the, the outside of the church, runs across the street, runs into his house, runs into his bedroom, into his closet, shuts the door, curls up in a little ball, is just crying. And the little brother is thinking, I'm next. What is going on? <laughs> so he goes, and he opens up his brother's closet, and he says, what happened in there? He's like, I don't know. But God's missing and they think we did it. <laughs> so, so whether your question is, where is God? Or who needs God? Or is there a God? These are all some really, really good questions. And this series is dedicated to those of us, just like me, who struggle from time to time with doubt, and disbelief, and despair. There is nothing wrong with your questions. Can I just say real fast, just pause? This room is packed, and I'm really excited about it. 
it's, it's no surprise to me that we have this need in October to, to add a third service. So I hope you guys are really excited about that. Don't forget, when you walk outside of these doors, that one more hub is going to like smack you in the face. You can't miss it, right? Make sure to take some time, if you're not already attending one and serving one, and you call ACC your home church, we would really love for you to up your commitment uh, on a Sunday morning. I'm going to stick around for two hours, I'm going to attend one, and I'm going to serve one. That kind of hub will show you all the options of where you could serve. It's going to be awesome. So stepping back in um, to this Who Needs God series. Remember, this is dedicated to, to those of you, just like me, who struggle with doubt, disbelief and despair from time to time. And I get it because, listen, if you have to choose between two boxes and one of them is I believe in Jesus or I believe in God and the other one is I don't believe in God, both of those boxes carry a whole bunch of of struggle for many of us. I mean, think about it. If you check the box that says I believe in God, there is a whole bunch of of, of stuff that's hard to swallow, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of life change, a lot of things that you might have to do differently or say, uh, you know, say that you know, I, I'm trying to be more like Jesus, so I have to maybe change the way I do my life a little bit. And that's, there's a lot of commitment in saying, I believe and choose to follow Jesus. I believe in God. I get it. That is a lot, that's a really hard box to check. On the other side... There's this idea of saying, I don't believe in God. To be honest, I think there's so much more disconcert, disconcerting thoughts on that side. The idea that we're just a bunch of molecules and cells and biology that somehow physics is holding down to this land and, and, and that it's all just some big accident. That scares me way more. So we have like this doubt. We have despair on the other side, and most of us were somewhere in between, and we, we struggle with, with these things. In fact, if you are on the side where you know, I, I don't believe in God at all. Remember last week we talked about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. This is a new category of people. In fact, it's the, the fastest growing category as far as religious affiliation in our country. 25% right now of the U.S. population considers themselves a nun. In other words, they consider themselves not affiliated to any religious belief. 25% would say, I I gladly check the I don't believe in God box. In in other words, really, I think a better way of saying it is they just don't check a box at all. They say, listen, I just don't want to weigh in on the subject. 25%, and that number is growing. And I think the reason why... We talked about this last week. There's two things, I think, that really cause doubt and disbelief and despair. And those two things are this idea of a somebody told me so God. In other words, you have this this, this somebody told you about who God is and what he's like. And that, that understanding of God didn't hold up to your kind of adult perspective of life. So you decided, you know what, I'm not going to believe in God anymore because that God doesn't exist. Remember, we talked about this last week. If you stop believing in one of those somebody told me so gods, good, because those gods don't exist. But there's another thing I think that keeps a lot of people from faith in God and faith in Christ. And that is this Bible tells me so Jesus. In other words, you struggle with something in the Bible. You open it up. And you read something and you say, oh, no, no, no. I don't want anything to do with this. Or somebody tries to disprove something in the Bible. You know, you have a a group of people that might say, listen, there is absolutely no historical evidence, no archaeological evidence of a worldwide flood. And you say, oh, well, then I guess the whole thing is, is false. Let's throw it out. So your struggle isn't necessarily with with God or who he is, but is instead with this idea of the Bible. You struggle with this book. And if that's you, that's what we're going to talk about today. So make sure you really tune in. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that all of us would do everything we can inside of us right now to open up our minds and our ears to hearing from you. 
God, I believe you exist because you've changed my life. But I understand that there might be people in this room who are struggling with doubt or struggle with disbelief or don't believe you're real at all. And I pray right now that they, this morning, would be willing to relax their hard stance on that subject and be willing to possibly hear from you this morning. God, I pray that you would prod all of us towards a deeper understanding and love for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're all familiar with a childhood song that most of us uh, sang when we were kids. And it's, uh, as far as this Bible tells me so, Jesus. You know, it's Jesus loves me, this I know, right? For the what? For the Bible tells me so. Now understand, we talked last week how there's like this kind of understanding and, and way you teach about God and the Bible to a child is a lot different than maybe to an adult. And this kind of understanding of, listen, uh, I, t- I, I sing this song with my kids. I'm not like downing this song, but the song in and of itself kind of leaves us to this almost immature understanding that the, the implication here is that the only reason I know that Jesus loves me is because it's in the Bible. And that if somehow I didn't have a Bible... I could not know that Jesus loved me. That my faith is so like attached to this book that if I didn't have it, that I would not be able to know that Jesus loves me. And that's what we're going to talk about. And some of the things we're going to talk about today are going to sound a little weird to come from a lead pastor. And I want you just to bear with me because any mess that I make I'm going to try to do my best to clean it up before you get up and leave, okay? We've, we've probably all heard this statement, if the Bible says it, that settles it. Have, have you ever heard that before? If the Bible says it, that settles it. If the Bible says it, that settles it. You ask a question to someone, well, it's in the Bible. Okay, but why? But it's in the Bible. The Bible says it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that settles it. And, and there's not technically, once you understand and, and truly have a reason to understand why this book is true and why you can believe everything in it, which is my belief, by the way. Let's just get it out there right now. I believe that every word in this book is, is true. I believe it's an inspired word of God. But I want to back away from that for a minute and get a little messy, okay? And we have this idea that, hey, if the Bible says it, that settles it. And then we tell our kids, like, hey, just believe it because it's in the Bible. And then we send them off with this little cutesy statement to college. Or we send them off to, just to the local library or to, to an overnighter with their friends or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, things that they have always been told are true because the Bible says that that settles it start to get challenged, and it rocks people's faith. It's no longer their faith's rocked in this God that doesn't exist. Now it's like, I put all of my marbles in this thing, and if one little piece of it falls apart, it all falls apart. Listen, this Bible's like an all-or-nothing sort of book. I don't believe that there's some parts in here that are true and some parts that are wrong and you just got to kind of figure it out. So what happens when, when you have this kind of understanding of, listen, if, if the Bible says it, that settles it. And that's kind of like the, the, where your faith in Scripture ends. It's just this, this, again, no questions, no asking, no pondering, no studying, no just, if it's in here, believe it. Then what happens when somebody challenges something that you believe Based on God's word, your faith starts to crumble, even if God's word is true. Listen, I've said it already. I believe God's word is true. But I want us to go deeper than that this morning. Don't get up and leave yet. Here's the first thing I want you to know. The Bible isn't proof of God. The Bible isn't proof. You know, when I um, had been married to my wife for, uh, I want to say, two and a half years, three years, we decided it was time to, to grow our family and to have our first. And 
So we got, we got pregnant, and uh, we went through this process, and everything was kind of going the way it was supposed to. We went on a youth retreat. So I was in the, the guy's cabin hanging out with a bunch of students in the guy's cabin, and my wife was in the girl's cabin hanging out with girls. Uh, like uh, I don't remember. I was with like sixth grade guys, and she was off with like seventh grade girls. And uh, in the middle of the night, I get, someone wakes me up. <clears throat> okay? We still have like six weeks before her due date. Someone wakes me up and says, your, your wife is in labor, or she, her water has broken. It's time to wake up. So she's, you know, in some really comfortable cabin bed, not really, right? And her water breaks in the middle of the night, and I get this, so I get up, and I'm getting all my stuff together, and we, we drive the hour and a half back to the hospital, and we're excited because we're having a baby, but we're scared because this is happening six weeks before it's supposed to, and there could be some, you know, complications. So we're just kind of pondering what's going on. Well, we, we go to the hospital, right? And we go through this process. We haven't actually finished, or we only did one of our classes that you're supposed to take. But, you know, you're, you're about to have a baby class. That's what I'm going to call it. You're about to have a baby class. There were supposed to be like six of those, and we had only made it to one. So we are like lost. We don't know really even what door to walk in the hospital. We're like, are we in the right spot? We're just like clueless about everything, Right? And they walk us through, they realize that we're supposed to stay, they don't send us home, so we go in and we go through this process and, and we end up having a, a beautiful baby girl who, believe it or not, six weeks early was healthy. They took her to the NICU just to check on her for a little bit, but, you know, they, so they, they get Michaela and she's just been born and, and they're doing all this stuff and they're like... Uh, you know, clean her up and, and all this stuff. And it's just an incredible experience, especially when you're going through this for the first time. And I'm not saying anything that, that those of you who are parents don't already know. It's just amazing, the miracle of everything. You're just kind of watching. And at some point in this process, I think that it's a good idea to tell my wife that my legs hurt. <laughs> now, y'all, listen, I've been standing for a while. Okay, this was a long day of standing, but this was the wrong thing to say to my wife, okay? Looking back, it was really foolish, but so I say, you know, my legs hurt. She's like, what? My mother-in-law's like, excuse me? And like, right, so we're having this. Well, I'm back over here, like, doing stuff, you know, cutting the cord and all this stuff, and, and at some point in this process, they, they're like, okay, we, we need you to fill out forms. Like, are you the father? I'm like, I, I better be, you know, so... So, you know, you have forms that you got to fill out, and they want to know the baby's name and all this stuff because they say, basically, we're going to send this off. And, and in like four to six weeks, you're going to get something in the mail called a birth certificate. Right? And then they're like, okay, now, listen, it's been two, two nights. Here's the baby. It's yours now. And they help you load your, your, your new family into a car, and it's the weirdest feeling I've ever experienced in my life. Is driving home feeling like I stole something from the hospital. <laughs> I'm like, are, we're, we're, we're good? We, I can leave? Right? It's just this, this weird feeling, and all of a sudden you're this new parent. And here's the craziest thing. For four to six weeks, there was absolutely no evidence from the perspective of a birth certificate that Michaela was ours. And here's why. That paper wasn't proof that we had a child. That birth certificate isn't proof that we have a child. The baby that I'm holding in my arms, that's proof that we had a child. This, this document was, is just kind of a way of, of documenting what happened. Listen, here's what happened, but it's not proof of what happened. The proof is right there. My wife's, my, the bags under her eyes are the proof of what happened. This... <laughs> This document right here is not proof. It's just documenting the event, just like God's Word. God's Word is not proof of the existence of God. It's not proof of the resurrection of Jesus. It's documenting things that actually happened. And when you actually go into God's Word and you study it and you look at it and you go, you even ask people who are complete uh, you know, archaeologists that are total atheists, don't believe in the existence of God whatsoever, and you ask them, can you, can you tell me, did, was there a real guy named Jesus? Absolutely there was. Was there really an empty tomb? Yep, it's, it's 
so well documented, we can't, we can't tell you that the tomb wasn't empty. We can't, we can't tell you why it was empty, but, but there was a guy named Jesus. He really did claim to be Jesus. Uh, he really did claim to be God's son, the Lord. And, and his tomb really is empty to this day. All of these things, when we really look at God's word, we can see that, that there are other reasons to believe that God's word is true. But God's word isn't proof for God. You guys want to go on a history lesson with me? I'm going to take you on a history lesson whether you like it or not. So I just want you to bear with me. So we are in 2017 on this thing called the Gregorian calendar. This is a calendar that we switched to somewhere, like officially we switched somewhere in the 16th century. There, it had been used uh, farther back, but we kind of officially adopted the Gregorian calendar in the 16th century. Before that, we used this thing called the Julian calendar. Okay? And the Julian calendar was another way of kind of figuring out what day of the week it was and, and all that. So this Gregorian calendar is this calendar that you're familiar with that has the B.C. and the A.D., you know, B.C. stands for before Christ, and the A.D. is, a lot of people think it's after death, but that would mean that the whole time Jesus was alive. It, it doesn't make sense. It's, it actually stands for Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. So we have this calendar that's split, and when historians, both atheists and non-atheists, go back and try to figure out uh, when Jesus was born on this calendar, believe it or not, uh, when we originally set up the calendar, we must have gotten it wrong. Because Jesus was most likely born between 2 and 3 B.C. In other words, Jesus was born two years before he was born. <laughs> the reason we know that is because the records show that he died on our Gregorian calendar around 30 A.D. And we actually know that he was about 33 years old when he died. So he was born really two to three years before, uh, before Christ. Which, again, a mistake in the calendar. So if we fast forward in, in 66 A.D., so 66 years uh, on the Gregorian calendar, there was this emperor named Emperor Vespasian. And he had a total uh, hatred of the Jewish people and of Christianity. And he declared a war that went on for four years. He was killing Jewish people, killing Christians. He would do all sorts of, every day hundreds were dying. This emperor hated the Christian people and the Jewish people. And he basically had them barricaded within the walls of Jerusalem. And they were every day trying to break down these walls so they could go in and kill all the Jewish and Christian people. And it wasn't until four years later that his son Titus was now in charge. And Titus was able to break down the walls, of, uh, break in an opening into Jerusalem, and they went in, and they basically burned down everything. They burned down the temple. They took uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of Jewish people and Christians and enslaved them. Now, let me tell you what. This is such an amazing moment in history that you have to ask yourself, why would that not be in Scripture? Why would this thing that happened in 70 A.D., all of these Christians being, being uh, enslaved and murdered and killed by this emperor and his son. Why would that not be in God's word? I'll tell you why. Now listen, if you ask an atheist who doesn't believe in God's word, when was this book written? They would tell you that it was sometime between 70 and 80 AD. The reason why is because that story doesn't exist anywhere in God's word. So therefore, God's word must not be true. But in all actuality, this, this understanding of Vespasian and Titus and what they did to the Christian people, it happened before the, the last book in this Bible was, was written. And it's important to understand this. You'll, you'll understand here in a second. You see, the Bible has no record of any of that happening. It would be like leaving World War II out of our history books. It wouldn't happen. If you read a history book and there is no World War II in it, the obvious understanding is that that book was written before World War II. Do you understand? And yet, certain people who are trying to disprove God's word, they want you to believe that this book was written 
after 70 AD, after all these events were happened, had, had happened, and that it was some, uh, you know, that, the, that the, ultimately the Bible isn't true. But I want to show you something really cool in Luke. Now, Luke was an eyewitness, an eyewitness of what happened to Jesus. So if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 3, it's going to be on page 1159 if you're using one of the, the Bibles in the chair back in front of you. This is one verse that you will rarely hear quoted in church. Here's what it says. It says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and uh, Trachonitis, and Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Why would anybody take the time to write everything that Luke chose to include in the opening of this paragraph? That would be like me saying, listen, in the second year of Bill Clinton's presidency... When Madeleine Albright was the Secretary of State and Glendening was the, the Governor of Maryland. The only reason I would say that is because I want you to know very clearly, whatever I'm about to say, go ahead and look it up. Google it. Test me. I was there. I know exactly when it happened and where it happened and why it happened. Go ahead and go into... Uh, the history books. Go into Google and figure out what I'm saying is true. Go ahead and test me. And what Luke is basically saying is anyone who wants to try to take the words that I'm saying right now and challenge them, he's like, I dare you. Here's how specific I can get about what I saw and what I witnessed and when it happened. It's amazing to me that he would go into such detail as if to dare us. So let's fast forward. From 70 A.D. Now remember, the temple was burned down. All the, the Jewish people and the Christians were enslaved and or killed. And Christianity and Judaism was completely uh, made illegal. You weren't even allowed in Jerusalem if you, uh, unless you were, uh, I guess, wanted to be enslaved or killed. It was illegal to be a Christian in Jerusalem. From 70 A.D. all the way to 312 A.D. That entire time, it was illegal to be a follower of Christ. It was illegal to follow the, the laws of the Old Testament as a Jewish believer. It was completely illegal. And then in 312 A.D., what's really important about this date is there was a new emperor... Now, when you hear that word, that tetrarch that we saw in those other, that, that verse, a tetrarch basically means that over this one area, there are four people in charge, and each of them is one of the tetrarchs. Well, this new emperor comes in, and he defeats the other guys. He doesn't want to share power. And this is Emperor Constantine. And Emperor Constantine says, listen, I want to be the guy who's in charge around here. So he defeats the other tetrarchs, and now he is the sole emperor over the Roman Empire. And what he does, because now he has other people who used to follow other rulers, he needs to rally everyone around something. He needs to get everyone to agree on something. He's like, what can I do? Maybe if I, you know, it, it can't be like, uh, you know, uh, the Ravens. It can't be, you know, like the, the uh, elite, Paul political. It can't be sports. It can't be. He's trying to figure out something. What can I rally everyone around that most people in all of these four areas that used to have different rulers would all agree on would be something that we can rally behind. And the one thing that he found that most people had in common, the one thing, the law he changed was that Christianity was so prevalent. Christianity was such an incredible thing in the, the, the land that he was now ruling over that that was the thing he chose to rally people around. He changed the law so that Christianity was no longer illegal. Christianity, believe it or not, became the, the state religion of the Roman Empire. Check this out. 
before the Old Testament and the New Testament were combined to form the Bible. In other words, before this ever existed, Christianity had already replaced the pantheon of Roman, barbarian, and Egyptian gods and had become the state religion of the Roman Empire. Why does any of this history matter? Why should we care what happened in 312 A.D. in regards to Christianity? And here's what I want you to understand. They believed in God. They believed in the Jesus of the Bible before the Bible told them so. Do you understand how important that that statement is? It had become the most prevalent religion in the Roman Empire, become the state religion in the Roman Empire. So, so powerful was it that Emperor Constantine said, let's have people rally again around this because this is the one thing that most of us agree on, that Christianity had grown and spread and done such an amazing thing in the Roman Empire before the Bible told anyone about it. Isn't that amazing? Before The Bible told me so. And I think the reason why that's important is because I I can imagine Peter. I can imagine someone coming up to Peter and saying, Hey, Peter, so you want to stake your life on this Jesus guy? And Peter's like, Yeah, I do. He's like, Well, listen, we've, we've done all the studying, we've done all the research, and there's absolutely no archaeological evidence at all for a worldwide flood. What do you have to say about that? He would say, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know why you can't find any archaeological evidence of a worldwide flood. But here's what I do know. I saw my Savior die on a cross. And I saw him three days, I saw him, his dead body put into a tomb. And three days later, I saw that the tomb was empty And then we were wondering what happened, and we couldn't understand it. And then I saw on on the beach one day, I was out with my buddies fishing, and I saw my risen Savior sitting there alive. I believe in Jesus, regardless of what you think you can or can't disprove about my Bible. I believe in Jesus because I've experienced Jesus. I believe in God and the existence of God because I've experienced God in my life. Now, the fact that there is this book that I, I have studied and I understand it to be true, and it does take an element of faith to believe that what's in here is true. I understand that. But I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus because the Bible tells me so. I believe in Jesus and in God because I've experienced the saving work of Jesus and God in my life. What happens when we have the other perspective is we put the Bible at the center. We basically set the Bible up and tell the, the world, the unbelieving and doubting world, listen, if you can just break down this book, find something in here that's not true, and I will stop believing. And we set the Bible up as the center of the debate instead of this understanding that people have experienced Jesus, they've experienced the the life-changing work of God in their lives, and that ought to be the question that we're talking about. You see, my faith doesn't hang by the thread of proving everything in the Bible. I believe it to be true, but I don't have to prove it all to you for my faith to hold true. Jesus loves me, this I know, Because Luke witnessed it, and he told me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, because James, Jesus' brother, he was willing to stake his life on it. Jesus loves me, this I know, because Paul risked his life and his career and ended up giving his life because he wants me to know so. Jesus loves me, this I know, because 10 of the 11 uh, remaining disciples after the resurrection, they, 10 of the 11 were martyred for their faith. 10 of the 11 were so sure of what they saw and they witnessed with their own eyes 
that historical evidence is beyond, uh, beyond a, a preponderance of doubt. People understand that these 10 people of the 11, they were so sure of what they knew to be true about Jesus because they witnessed it with their own eyes, that they were willing to die for it. How many people do you know willing to die for a lie? Now listen, this guy Peter, he was so sure that he didn't even want to be crucified the same way his Savior was. So when he was killed for his faith, he said, crucify me upside down. And they hung him to a cross and hung him upside down. That's the kind of faith, that's the kind of understanding that was recorded in this true document, inspired word of God that I can see and understand the that Jesus loves me, this I know, because of what Peter was willing to die for. You see, their faith was not based on a book, but an event. Their faith was not based on a book. It was based on an event. A life-changing event. Something that they witnessed, that they experienced. Now listen. Write this, this second thing down. The Jesus of the Bible is proof. The Jesus of the Bible is proof. If the Bible isn't proof, then let's let Jesus be the proof that we need. In John 10, 37, Jesus actually said these words. He said, if I do not do the works of my Father... Do not believe me. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. In other words, he's saying, try me. You don't take my word for it. Watch what I can do and what I'm doing in the lives of people around me. If I'm not doing the work of God, then don't believe me. But I'm going around and I'm doing God's work. And people are witnessing it and recording it so that you and I in 2017 on this Gregorian calendar can read about it and understand what the real Jesus accomplished and what he did. And he's basically saying, try me. If I tell you that In-N-Out Burger is the best burger I've ever had in my life, Many of you would have, have had one before, and you know that that's true. Now, for those of you who don't, you just have to take my word for it. But you could get on a plane and fly to the West Coast and try it for yourself. You could see and experience for yourself that an In-N-Out Burger truly is the best burger of all time. In the same way, Jesus is saying, listen, if I'm not doing work in your life, if, I'm not do, if you don't see the work I've done in the life of someone around you, if you're not seeing what I did in the lives of the, uh, the apostles and, and, and in, in the, the lives of the early Christians and the early church, if you can't see that, look. Because if I'm not doing the works of my Father, do not believe me. Listen, I've never been to Jerusalem to see for myself. I've never, to be honest, I've never been to seminary. I know a lot about the Bible, but I don't know everything about the Bible. I, in fact, I think a lot of the people on our staff know more about the Bible than I do. But here's what I do know. I've experienced the life-changing work of Jesus in my life. My faith is not based on the book, even though I believe everything in this book to be true. My faith is based on the Jesus of the Bible and what he's done in my life and the lives of people around me. And I want to encourage you and challenge you that if you have your faith wrapped up in a book that people try time and time and time again to break down and to disprove and to mess up your faith. Maybe you're putting your faith in a book and not in a person, not in the man and the event of what happened on that cross and the resurrection of Christ. So I want to challenge you, don't put your faith in, uh, this sounds really bad when I say don't put your faith in the Bible. Listen, this book is so true. Everything in here this is an incredible way that God has revealed himself to us. So I'm not going to say those words, don't put your faith in the Bible. Here's what I'm saying. 
Don't put your faith solely in this book that when somebody comes and, and says, listen, I've, I've figured out a way to, to trip you up or to disprove something in here. And they think they found something that doesn't line up. That it is what messes your faith up. Because your faith ought to be in Christ and what he can do in your life. So if we believe Jesus to be true, and by the way, most atheists know that Jesus was a real man that really walked on the face of this earth, that, that did the things, uh, many of the things he said he did. Uh, if we believe that Jesus is the reason for our faith, that Jesus is the way to the Father, if we, we choose to put our faith in a man instead of a, 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 a documentation of what that man has done, wouldn't it be awesome to see what that man, that Jesus, has to say about God? That's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to see and go into God's word. What does Jesus say about God? Now, two weeks from now, we're going to go back to that one God that we talked about last week. One of those nun gods. This God uh, called the bodyguard God. How does a good God let bad things happen to good people? That question, two weeks from now... We are going to dive in unapologetically and explore how does a good God let bad things happen to good people. Let's pray together. Father, I am thankful for you. I'm thankful for the experience of what you've done in my life. I picture the man right now in John chapter 9 who you gave sight to. He had been born blind and you came up and you rubbed mud in his eyes and when he was able to see, the Pharisees asked him, they said, who is it that did this to you? And he said, listen, I don't know who he was or whether or not he was a sinner. All I know is I once was blind and now I see. God, I know that I once was blind and now I see. I put my faith in you because of the work, the life-changing work, the joy that you've brought into my life. I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for the Bible that you've given to us that helps uh, in a, help us to understand who you are and, and how and why you did what you did for us. But God, help us to remember to, that ultimately our faith rests in you. And that if someone tries to destroy your word, it's not going to mess up our faith in you. We can stand firm in understanding your Bible is true because we believe you and what you said about it. And we believe this because you're a good God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.